if anything makes uh, the world go round beyond love, it's definitely capital. And um, Rolf, a pleasure to have you here. I mean, there, you know, when you talk about sort of the the 800-pound gorilla, and I'm sure you want to be described that way, of uh, venture. Sequoia definitely has that moniker. The rate of change is speeding stuff up. Uh, I remember being on stage at an SU executive program, God, about a year and a half ago with uh, Astro Teller and Steve Jurvetson, and we were talking about sort of the hockey stick of, of growth, where uh, when AI is, you know, 10 years down the line, 3D printing is 10 years down the line, and your ability to iterate on technology cycles is ferociously fast. So how do you, how do you start to think about, about that, about you know, competition coming from everywhere and the speed and life cycles of products uh, becoming very difficult to deal with? Does that concern you at all? Or does it excite you? It excites me. I think it, it creates as much opportunity as it creates threats. Mm -hmm. um, I think it means that as an investor, you need to have a real growth or learning mindset. I, I think of myself as an apprentice every single day where we're investing today in things that I couldn't have imagined 10 years ago. And so it forces me to learn about these new areas, which is obviously stimulating and fun. I, I think when it comes to business, you know, part of the success of the Formidable Five, as I mentioned earlier, shows that it's not just about technology per se, because they have really successful businesses where I think a lot of the innovation is actually happening inside the big companies right now, uh, which is fantastic at some level, but also scary at another because of their market power. Um, I just got back from China and uh, was there with a group of uh, A360 members visiting venture funds and startups. And I was blown away by uh, the the uh, the passion and the ferociousness and the competition and the amount of capital and the amount of startups and it really uh, was very much a Silicon Valley set of, uh, of, of players. Um, are, are you, how much are you invest, how much are you paying attention to the Chinese market uh, and how aggressively, aggressively are you pursuing China? So we had an offsite at Sequoia in 2005 and we called the offsite 2020. I still have a jacket that says 2020 on it. And we felt as though if we wanted to be an investor in the leading technology companies in the world in 2020, we had no choice but to open up offices in India and China. And so we did, uh, long before I think it became fashionable. The way we did that was to recruit local teams and to empower them. We thought that we'd end up with terrible outcomes if we tried to remote control decisions from Menlo Park here in Silicon Valley, you know, what do, what do I know about the nuances of what really works in China? So we recruited great people and empowered them. They have autonomous decision making, and we have distinct funds in China and India, and they've been off to the races. Um, our team in China has had a phenomenal track record. Totally, so I don't spend that much time there myself. I've been there a few times, obviously, to visit our team. Um, but I've got to amplify what you said. I mean, the, the, the rate of innovation, the, the aggression, and I don't mean that in a negative sense, just the, the passion. Um, you know, our partners in China take meetings at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night. Yeah. The founders are working six, seven days a week. Yeah, I was, I was saying the, the mantra it's, in China that we saw was, you know, 9, 12, 6 or 9, 12, 7, which is you're working from 9 a.m. to midnight, six days a week or seven days a week, yeah. period. Yeah. yeah, I don't know whether I'm glad I'm not there or I'm fearful <laughs> I'm not there, <laughs> but it's intimidating. Uh, what are you most what fields are you most excited about in Sequoia right now in terms of over the next two to five year time frame, uh, what are the areas that you're hoping to see some really exciting uh, ventures in? What, what, what strikes I'd, your heart? I'd love to see us innovate in augmented reality. Uh, you in know, which reality? Augmented, augmented reality. reality. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure most audiences have seen the movie Her. This idea of having an invisible UI, which is voice-based, and having a different way of interacting with technology. Um, I'm sure for everyone here at the conference, if you look at people at, at lunch breaks, it's kind of strange that we've evolved where we're all sitting there hunched over these very small screens, you know, all developing, you know, next strains. And it's hard for me to imagine that that's the end state. You know, is that really where we're going to be in 2025? I have a hard time believing that that's the case. So 
that's an area that to me is very interesting. We have a 3D printing company that I'm very excited about, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and then I think about CRISPR and the, the promise of gene editing to, to cure disease, uh, I think is a phenomenal area of innovation. Um, let's talk about sort of the alternatives to venture and do any of them. So actually, before we go there, uh, a lot of people just think of venture capital as uh, come give me money. Uh, but it's much more than that. All right, can you, can you talk about sort of the, the value you provide companies besides just capital? Because uh, I've had a lot of conversations, and this is something I, I fundamentally believe as well, a lot of com uh, conversations with, with entrepreneurs and where they're saying, oh, I'm going to get the money from, from these angels and, and these wealthy individuals. And I'm like, you know, you really should try and get a top-tier venture fund in there uh, to lead and not just take the money at a higher valuation from somebody else. In fact, you should be willing to take a more conservative valuation to get the right venture in there. <clears throat> thank you. Well, <laughs> I believe that. We believe that too, <laughs> but thank you for saying that. The, um, I think there, sometimes it's good to raise small amounts of money from you know, friends and family to get an idea off the ground, but what you often need is advice. And what <clears throat> we, don't, we don't have the answers to all your questions. And I've been on the other side of the table, having been an executive at, at PayPal and understood the difference between a board member who shows up once every four weeks and probably speaks to the CEO every week, but isn't inside the company 80 hours a week. And so there's a different texture that a board member understands about your business. But the board member brings this incredible wealth of experience, this um, pattern matching where they've seen so many other instances um, where they can just help you avoid the mistakes and avoid you having to make them for the first time. And that might be uh, strategic direction. Um, I remember when we partnered with YouTube early on, Time was uh, clamoring uh, with Chad that they wanted to have a private label YouTube site for Time. And that was one of the conversations we had, is should we do that or should we not? Well, I think in retrospect, it would have been a terrible decision for YouTube to become this white label provider to a bunch of other media companies. And that's the sort of conversation we had. Um, recruiting early team members, helping uh, the team interview executives to join. Um, these are the sort of things that we provide help on. Yeah, I was having a conversation with somebody in the room earlier saying, I've got this hot young CEO, he's 21, the company's growing very rapidly, but you know, how, do we, how do we transition it from sort of a pure startup and bring in the right talent and to grow? It sort of like, you know, reminds me of, uh, of uh, you know, Zuck bringing in Cheryl or, or Larry and Sergey bringing in Eric. And, I mean, that's the sort of help that you can provide a company that you invest in. That kind of help um, at a ground level. We have a human capital team that will help you recruit, you know, your first three engineers. Um, we obviously have a marketing team that will help you think through your press release and your go-to-market strategy. And then the board member who just provides that ongoing advice. It might be a business model uh, decision that you're weighing. It really depends. I mean, it's a very bespoke business at that level. Mm -hmm. uh, the advice that we offer really depends on what you need. And it's often about having a conversation partner. Because it's unlikely that I've seen exactly the situation you're dealing with, but I've seen other similar situations. So I can engage in a conversation to help you think through the alternatives, and hopefully together we can arrive at a good answer. Your investment horizon. So you invest in a company in Series A, Series B. What kind of time horizon are you, are you willing to look at in some of these sort of uh, more complex tech spaces? Uh, so I've been on one board for 11 years, and the company went public, and two years after they went public, we still haven't sold a single share. So, you know, and, and back to that earlier statistic, if you'd, if you'd bought every single Sequoia company at its IPO and held it until today, all of them, including the ones that ultimately failed, you'd have made more money than if you invested when we did and sold at the IPO. Wow. And so part of, the, part of the, the point is that you need to be really, really patient in this business. Um, you know, I don't know if you know about the marshmallow tests they did at Stanford University. Yeah, it's, it's a big it's nursery a, school. Ahead, it's a, I, I do it with my test, I test my <laughs> six-year-old boys. With it. Go ahead. So they did these experiments uh, at Stanford in the 1970s or 80s, I think, and four-year-olds would be given a marshmallow, and they'd be left alone in the room, and they'd be told, if you, if you eat it, it's yours, but if I come back in 15 minutes and you haven't yet eaten it, you'll get a second one. And consistently, about a third of the children delayed gratification and got the second marshmallow. And the, the professor in question who ran these studies, his child was in the class, and many years 
later noticed the differences between those groups of children. And so he, he did a longitudinal study and found out those who passed the marshmallow test had better SAT scores, went to better colleges, had lower divorce rates, earned more money. I mean, it's just, but it's sort of obvious at some level. You know, it's the same person who doesn't go party on Saturday, but instead, you know, prepares for the exam. And so the, the, I always talk about it similarly in our business. You need to pass the marshmallow, marshmallow test. You don't sell as soon as the lockup expires. Amazing. Uh, okay, we're going to wrap in, in the next couple minutes. Uh, uh, the changing face of capital. So capital used to be somewhat scarce. And now we're seeing, uh, we're seeing seed capital, angel, uh, you know, angel list, uh, uh, even sovereigns coming down, and capital's coming from all kinds of different directions. Uh, thoughts, is, is venture strong? Is, it, is, it, is there, how is the capital marketplace changing in your mind? I do think you're right that it's coming from all sides. Um, I think in general it's, in general it's good, I think in general it makes the industry sharper. I feel it's more competitive than it was when I joined the business 14 years ago, which must be a good thing for the entrepreneur because we're thinking harder about how to provide great services and do the right thing for the entrepreneur than ever before. Um, the bad thing probably comes from the flush of capital later on where I think companies can raise more than they maybe should mm -hmm. and they don't breed good habits. Yeah, you know, the struggle no is important for a fine wine and a good company. And necessity being the mother of invention. Yeah. I mean, at PayPal, when the market crashed in 2000, we had a certain amount of capital and we had to make it work. And man, did we innovate on fighting fraud and figuring out our business model because we had to, we had no choice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it truly is the most exciting time ever. And Rolf, a real pleasure. Thank you for spending the time with us and excited to uh, track Sequoia public companies and hold them. <laughs> Please help me in thanking Rolf for his time. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.